Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Linda Yarden. I'm co-chair of the Membership and Inclusion Committee here at Park Avenue Synagogue. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight to hear Rabbi Cosgrove in dialogue with Dr. Joy Layden. Dr. Layden is the first openly transgender employee of an Orthodox Jewish institution. From 2003 to 2021, she held the David and Ruth Gottesman Chair in English at Stern College for Women of Yeshiva University. Dr. Layden has a PhD in American literature and has been featured on national public radio. 2022 has already brought a lot of good news for Dr. Layden. The Book of Anna was awarded the National Jewish Book Award in Poetry. The Massachusetts Council, Cultural Council awarded her a Poetry Fellowship. And in May, her 10th book of poetry, Shekhinah Speaks, was published. I would very much like to share with you one of her poems entitled North and South. North and South, don't underestimate your need to cross the line. Frozen on the wrong side of your desire to remake the world, inverted in the mirror of your loneliness, of your otherness. How can you be true to the truth of being human? Something that bends in a universe that doesn't, a messy blend of guts and spirit, responsibility and shame. You are only an inch from the constantly moving source of life. No matter how passionately you crush yourself into the boxes, male or female, north or south, poor or rich, white or some other social shade you check because you are scared to cross the lines that keep you safe from more complicated combinations of love and loneliness, rocking your soul to sleep while you stuff your body into two tight boxes knowing no one will mind. You don't have the guts to live as long as you stay on your side of the line. So, wow, how can you be true to the truth of being human? It should come as no surprise that on behalf of adult education, the membership and inclusion committee and all of Park Avenue Synagogue, it is our pleasure and absolute honor to introduce our guest, Dr. Joy Layden, and our incredible rabbi, Rabbi Elliot Cosgrove. Let me turn it over to you, Rabbi. Linda, thank you so much, and thank you for your leadership of our inclusion committee, and thank you for all you do on behalf of our synagogue. It is really a pleasure um, to have this event, which is a reminder that um, inclusion is not something that we do merely once a m uh, month, uh, once a year during Pride Month, but it is a value that we hold dear um, throughout the year, each and every day. Um, this evening's program representing uh, the values that we try to uh, embody um, each each and every week of the year. So thank you um, to Linda Yarden and the entire inclusion committee for all that you do. And of course, thank you to uh, to uh, Rabbi Kaufman. Thank you to uh, Julie Schwartz. Thank you to Mara Bernstein. Thank you to everyone in our programming and adult ed committee uh, who make our programming possible. Dr. Layden. It is wonderful to welcome you here, and um, thank you so much. You you are muted, but I hope you don't stay muted very long because um, a lot of people are here, both uh, physically, not physically, but uh, here and on live stream. And I think that through the wonders of technology, that if people have questions for you, then I think they can type them into the live stream chat, and somehow magically they will appear to me. So after I get through my thousand questions that I want to ask you, um, uh, that uh, we will have an opportunity to hear questions from the community in the hour that we have. Um, Linda was so gracious in her introduction and sharing your the uh, poetry that you wrote. Um, and to continue to write, um, my, my, the text that I'll choose to shape 
uh, our, our hour together is um, this week's Torah reading, because I'm a rabbi. And um, when we read Parshat Naso, um, of course, it's um, the Parsha which describes a census, a counting of uh, ancient Israel. Um, and um, as has oft been noted, that the real task um, of one human being to another is not so much counting people, but making sure people know that they count. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, your um, writing, uh, the, the model um, that you embody, um, it really speaks to um, that value and that value which I hope is felt um, by everyone in the synagogue each and every day of the year um, that um, everyone is created um, with an equal and infinite dignity um, and that it's our job as a synagogue to embrace, to include, and to raise up that divine spark which is the unique possession of each and every individual and so when we welcome you, it's not just you, it's also the entire community um, should feel um, what this evening represents. So welcome, Dr. Layden. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Um, well, I, uh, I wanted to, I, I um, had the pleasure, um, though I, I want to be careful with um, the language I use because um, in reading your book, I had the pleasure of reading a very painful book, Through the Door of Life, A Jewish Journey Between Genders in Preparation, as well as, of course, um, a book of Anna and some writing that we'll get to as a dialogue unfolds um, of theological content. But let's start with the biographical content, yes. because um, this is a, an evening um, about you, but it's about far more than you meaning we're, we're asking big questions about um, uh, the signals that uh, synagogues, the Jewish community, institutional life um, of, of our people signal um, to children um, and adults as they are going through their journeys of life, and in your case, the journey between genders. And so I'm wondering if in, we could begin the evening um, biographically so, and if you could sort of share with us um, the broad, out everyone should buy your book, but um, the broad outlines and perhaps also with an eye to the fact that this is a synagogue event, and I'm curious to hear sort of the explicit and implicit messaging that happens um, in synagogues and Jewish institutions. Thank you, Rabbi. Yes, I'll give some spoilers for my memoir. Um, I grew up in the 1960s and 70s in Rochester, New York. Um, and my family was Jewishly identified in a way that I think was not unusual for that period in American Jewish history. My mother came from um, a very uh, orthodox extended family, but her mother had left uh, Oxy and chosen um, a secular political lifestyle, got thrown out of Russia for it. And uh, so my mother was grew up in the Montreal ghetto with a strong sense of Jewish ethnic identity doesn't quite say it. She, uh, she, she felt that it was really important to be Jewish, that that um, was something that was given to her that she needed to pass on. My father uh, grew up in Brooklyn uh, to um, parents who came up through the labor union. They were shop stewards and uh, immigrants, and they did not have much connection to Judaism as a religion. I think that they probably did seders, but I doubt they lit Shabbat candles and. My father's relation to Judaism was um, graphically illustrated every Pesach. Uh, during the Seder, he would have his kippah, would start out at this angle on his head. And we had to get through the Maxwell House Haggadah before the kippah fell off. So um, being Jewish didn't matter nearly as much to him as it did to my mother. But, you know, being... Um, a good Jewish mother. She wanted to find a synagogue so that her children would know who they were. That's her uh, language. 
for this. She felt that we wouldn't know who we were unless we knew ourselves as Jews, which I think is a very profound, it sort of seems simple, but it's a very deep way to think about it. And she chose the strangest synagogue, certainly in Rochester, but possibly in North America at that time. It was a combination of an Orthodox synagogue that burned down and reform, basically, not religious families who were looking for a Hebrew school. And somehow they had merged and created this co uh, congregation that no rabbi could satisfy for more than a year because the Orthodox old men went to services. And if you pleased them, then you wouldn't please the young families and vice versa. So, um, so I grew up knowing that I was Jewish, knowing that that was a very important identity and that it was an identity that connected me to people all over the world. People that I didn't know uh, connected me to um, Israel, but also um, really people around the world. And it connected me to a past, a very rich past and a very rich culture, and it connected me to a future. I knew, although I didn't understand in those, you know, post-Holocaust decades, there was some unexplained importance attached to my life and to my maleness in a certain kind of way, you know, that I was supposed to um, have Jewish children was not stated, but I, I think it was, it was felt that um, we'd had a, a brush with extermination and um, it was everybody's job to make sure that, that, uh, that we kept the line going. So Jewish identity, um, we lived in a non-Jewish area. So I was, had the experience of being a, a minority that wasn't understood, but the, the minority identity wasn't defined in the negative. It wasn't, well, I'm different from everybody else in this way and that way and the other way. It was uh, defined as a positive web of connections, um, but not in a religious sense. At the same time, I had this other identity um, which was my gender, not that I knew the word gender, but as long as I can remember, I identified as female. I knew that that didn't make sense. I would, from early childhood, I would think about this and I would think about how this didn't make sense and I would try to figure out what I was. But what I knew was that despite the facts of my male body and the, the, um, the way everybody around me saw me um, and that I knew that that wasn't who I was, that somehow who I really was, was female. So this and, wasn't as a, this wasn't as a teenager. This was, this was from your earliest memories. I remember the first day of preschool is when I realized that, some, that something was misaligned here because when I showed up, my mother, um, had stayed home to raise me. So I was dying to play with other children. So I walk into the preschool and immediately run to play with the other kids. And I ran to my natural care group, which to me I thought was the girls, but they all jumped up and ran away from me. And they kept doing that. And I thought they're, you know, I got a little, they're a little late. Maybe I missed something. There was clearly some game going on that I didn't understand. And then I realized that they didn't see me as like that. They saw me as something that was different. Um, so yeah, it goes as far back as I can remember. And once I became aware of it, um, by first grade, I was consciously hiding that part of my identity. I felt that it was dangerous to me. Um, I felt that if other people knew who I really was, they would not love me. I would become unlovable. I would. I didn't have a strong sense of what would happen, but in the 60s, the options were not good for kids who came out as trans. Some of them were experimented on by psychologists. Many were institutionalized and many, as is still the case today, were kicked out of their houses to live on the streets. Um, but uh, there weren't supportive families at that time. So I felt that this was something that I needed to keep hidden for my own safety, but I also felt that it was a threat to my family. I felt that it made me different from everybody else around me. And so I had these two very different minority identities. 
one of which being Jewish was a way of being different, but it was visible. It was something that I was supposed to be proud of, and it connected me to all kinds of things that were sustaining, and indeed, I think it kept me alive. The other identity made me feel that I didn't have anything in common with any other human being and often made me feel that I shouldn't be alive, that I was just too different to, um, to fit in. And when I, I, I was, unlike my family, I was really religious. I um, had a sense of God as a presence that I interacted with from a very early age. And because my family wasn't religious, I had freedom to imagine Judaism in a form that I needed it to be. So I kind of, as a kid, created a Judaism that centered on this relationship to a God who is right there with you and on the Torah, which I read without the adult supervision. Um, I read it on my own. I liked it, um, oddly That's enough. It is a good book. Not None of my peers uh, felt that that was uh, their favorite thing to read. But um, but one of the reasons I liked it was because when I started reading it, it immediately was clear to me that it was about someone like me, someone who was invisible to people around them and who loved human beings but couldn't be seen or understood by them and was constantly being forgotten. And I think I was also attracted to God's anger over being constantly forgotten by the Israelites. I think I was very angry that I wasn't seen by the people, you know, the sort of the first duty of parents, as I knew when we started having children, is you need to see them. They look to you not because they're interested in you, they don't care that much about you for a long time, but because they want to see that you see them. That is very important. And when you grow up, in hiding, hiding who you really are, you you don't have the sense that the people who are around you, who love you, that they really see you or love you. So when I read the Torah's descriptions of God's very difficult relations with the Israelites, I felt that it was really similar. I mean, I sided with God in those conflicts. And I think I was... Um, I didn't have this language, but I think I saw God as a model of an out and proud queer person, you know, a person who does not fit any of the categories, any of those boxes in that are in the poem North and South. Um, but it, unlike me, you know, God is not trying to hide, not trying to fit in or hide those differences. And God, instead, God is saying, actually, I don't fit into your community, but you need me at the center of your community. Your community depends on my presence. And so you're going to have to learn to live with. And was there anyone or any institution or any individual uh, growing up that you were able to um, uh, speak openly um, about your struggle, about um, what was there any support system? Um, that you had, um, even the language of being transgender or otherwise, was, was this? Um, no, there were you because, because I think about, you know, when I'm hearing you you speak, Dr. Layden, the, the image that comes to mind is Murano's, right? Uh, with, with an exterior, um, with an interior that's hidden from the world. Um, but where the, where the analogy breaks down is, that hopefully, you know, I don't know what it was like in uh, Spain pre-Inquisition, but you might have had a community of sorts. And here, it, 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 from the, the way you're describing it and the way you, you've written about it, um, there, there was no one else with whom you could have that inside even as you were othered from the community. But I don't want to put words in your mouth. I just wanted to... No, to that's... Hear. That's right. Um, I, I uh, saw a film about a Jewish boy who was hidden in Nazi Germany with a non-Jewish family. And um, when I say it was a comic film, fortunately, 
you know, it had a happy ending. But when I saw the way that he was constantly in terror that people would see who he really was, I recognized that that was my childhood. I wasn't living in Nazi Germany, but I, I felt that I was living in a world that would want to get rid of me and that that would extend even to my own family. Um, and it's a terrible way to grow up. And it, it is more extreme than oppressed communities who live in hiding. Usually at least you share that with some other people. But um, many LGBTQ children grow up feeling isolated because they don't know, even today, I mean, now the internet helps people connect when they're isolated in, in their immediate surroundings. But, um, but when you feel that it's unsafe to talk about who you are, it's pretty hard to find other people. I mean, you can't even tell if there are adults who would be accepting and supportive because you're risking everything if you come out to them. And again, it's kind of the, if you're a Jewish kid living in hiding in Nazi Germany, which of the Germans do you decide you can trust with that information? Right. Right, you know, it, it just, it's very painful um, to hear this because as a community leader, um, and I, you know, we'll get to prescriptive steps as, as the conversation flows, but, you know, sometimes I think to myself, what does it all boil down to? What's the North Star? Yeah. And, um, you know, for me, uh, it is the idea that a, a synagogue is a place, of course, a place of struggle, and I want people to struggle. I think that's part of being a Jew, um, but I want people to feel whole in their struggles, uh, in the community, that a synagogue of all places um, should be a place um, that accepts you, inspires you, pushes you, um, but at the end of the day recognizes um, uh, you for who you are in all your struggles. And um, the idea of um, going through your childhood, which is um, really and and beyond your childhood, of of feeling that you are something that you are not, um, is is uh, and not having um, a religious institution to turn to, just is 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 very painful and a, and a failure um, on many on many levels. Um, so so what was? Oh, it? Rabbi, I just yes, want to say that that is the most. I think the most beautiful definition of diversity and inclusion that I've heard, usually people talk about it as in terms of, well, we want people who are other, people who are different to feel welcome and to feel okay and to feel safe. And this is, this is important, but these are formulations that make it all like an act of generosity or kindness toward by or by definition different from us which which i think ends up limiting things it means that whatever they are even if they become members of the community they're always marked as different and other and you're being nice to them and also uh it means that it kind of feels like a, you know it's a sacrifice to put in energy into taking care of people who are really different from you but what you said was that you think that the synagogue should be a place where everybody can bring their whole selves to struggle. And, and I think that that's true. I think that that's really what inclusion and diversity is about is all of us have parts of us that we are afraid will not be accepted and that won't fit in, that won't fit into those socially accepted boxes. And religious communities often like other communities, emphasize normativity. They emphasize people being the way we expect them to be, identifying people at a glance and that sort of thing. And we don't think about what we require people to leave outside the door. People change all the time. People have struggles that are difficult and you framing the work of diversity and inclusion in terms of making sure that everybody can be here with their whole selves I think that that gets to the heart of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Now, something along the way, and you, you touch on this in, in your book, um, prompted you to risk it all. You were married, you had children, you were, uh, uh, you still are, but a, a professor, a respected academic, and um, a moment in time um, where um, uh, that uh, live, living um, in hiding or um, no longer became, no, was no longer a tenable option. And so I'm wondering if you could describe um, for those uh, here um, virtually, um, what, what, what prompted uh, that shift? Mm -hmm. what, what stopped you from keep on keeping on? That is a great question. And the answer that I would like to be able to give would be one of a sudden surge of existential courage and authenticity. Suddenly I realized I had to throw off my shackles and be who I was, follow my role model, God, and be out and proud as being different. But that was not what happened. Um, instead, the moment that I realized that I couldn't keep living as a man, where I started to realize that, was um, at the beginning of a school semester. I would come in very early because I was commuting from Massachusetts and I would drink tons of coffee. So I was constantly going to the bathroom and I'm walking to, nobody else is there and I'm walking to the restroom and there's a, a student, this is Stern College, so it was a female student walking toward me. And I thought, I looked at her and I thought, wow, I bet she's not thinking about gender. And I thought, I bet nobody on, in this building is thinking about gender. Maybe not on this block, maybe not in, you know, in this entire neighborhood. Is anybody thinking about gender but me? And I think about gender every waking minute. It's like consuming my thoughts, constant measuring of, you know, my feelings and other people and locating it was, and then I, it was a sudden glimpse of how um, consuming the control mechanisms that I have been using to keep myself in my male persona, which had become, be, been becoming progressively more difficult as time went on. So it was taking more and more of my consciousness to do this. And I, I want to say, like, I'm all for gender studies and that sort of thing. But when you think about gender constantly from early childhood, it really does kind of get boring, particularly because I was only thinking about binary gender. I, there are a lot more ways to think about gender now. And I had gone around the gerbil wheel over and over and over again. And so it was a glimpse of that I was at the breaking point, um, that I was devoting too much of myself to something that really wasn't getting me anywhere. Um, at the same time, I think that that was just an early warning sim uh, symptom of um, something had shifted inside me, it had been shifting, and um, I just, it was like my psyche and my soma kind of broke apart. I started to get physically sicker and sicker. Um, I was unable to sleep, I couldn't keep food down, I was, um, I was a mess. Um, and I realized I couldn't it was, God, I, I hate even remembering it now, but my, I had spent most of my life being dissociated from my male body. And that dissociation was breaking down. So it, you know, my, um, I was uh, covered in hair. It felt like insect legs. It was just like everything felt wrong and awful. And I couldn't bear the sound of my own voice. Um, and I realized I couldn't do this anymore. And so I, I came to what to me seemed like an eminently logical solution. I needed to kill myself because it would be terrible for my, my wife and my children to live through my gender transition. I don't even think I had the word gender transition at that point, but I'd grown up believing that what I was was 
so horrible that if people who thought they loved me ever saw it, they would see me as an unlovable monster. And I couldn't do that to my wife and children. I knew my marriage would break up. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, the, the, the good parent thing to do was to kill myself. And, but we were, we were struggling young academic family and I realized that wasn't good. So I had to get life insurance and the life insurance policy had a two year waiting clause on suicide. And I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do to get through these years? I felt like I was in, stuck in the slowest elevator in the world and in that time, I started risking talking to one or two people in my life. I tried to talk to um, my wife, who had known about this for ages. We got together in college, but, you know, um, she wasn't in a position to be supportive uh, about it. But... Um, I came out to a friend in Israel and she made what I thought was a crazy suggestion. She said, have you talked to a therapist about this? And I had tried a couple of times over the years and therapists then, even still, they're not very well, they're not really trained in it. And then they weren't trained at all and they just didn't want to talk about it. So I said, well, why would I talk to a therapist about this? This problem is not my mind, it's my body. And I said, you know, just humor me. Find a therapist, talk to a therapist, you know, I don't think the suicide thing is really the best. I said, you know, you're a Orthodox, you think family is everything, don't you think this makes sense? Said, I'm not really sure it's the best thing for your family. So I humored her and I found a therapist who uh, did have experience with this. And even then it was a struggle because my whole life was premised on the idea that I didn't have a right to be who I was. That who I really was, what had no right to exist, and that it, that if who I really was ever did exist, it would be terrible for the people around me. And in fact, that was true for the family that I had built on the basis of my male persona. I, uh, my wife had made it clear eight years before that she could only, you know, she's a heterosexual woman, she could only live with a man. And we had three young children. And so my feeling that it would be horribly damaging to people if I ever became myself now had a grounding in, in reality. And I had never believed that I had a right to be who I was. All I had was this feeling, which I think was the most, like the part of me that was closest to God, I would say. I just had this part of me that just wanted to be alive not to be pretending to be alive, not to be dissociated and going through the motions, not to be loving people whose love I could never really feel because I didn't feel I was really there, but actually alive. That part could never be convinced by all of my many arguments that other people needed me to do this. That part kept saying, no, you need this. Right. And I, I was very struck by uh, the biblical way you you framed the chapter on it about choosing life, and uh, and um, and then the well, maybe we'll I don't know if we'll get to it, but the anecdote at the end of of whether you felt in dialogue with one of your children that you felt that you were more alive, um, and 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 so the so first of all, I'm again just so moved by what you're saying, uh, Professor, because. Um, it, it strikes me that of the hundreds of people who are watching right now, um, the, the, the statistically speaking, there there are probably um, uh, members of the community, the online community, who are themselves going uh, through struggles with who they are, um, and that they should know um, that um, they are not alone, and they should know that they should choose life. Um, and maybe we'll come back to that. The the cascade. I mean, in in choosing life, you had a um, rupture with a whole series of other assumptions. Your family, your profession, which played out in the New York Post, um, 
your chill your relationship with your children um uh and i'm just uh so with with gratitude to god for having chosen life um i i can only imagine the 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 cascade of implications it's had um uh beyond and i'm just wondering how have you been able to um reconstruct mm. your i i mean i i your your it sounds like your 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 marriage to your wife um is no longer um uh, you know please god you know these things don't happen overnight but that your relationship to your your children um your 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 teaching i believe can you tell us sort of how how uh, the landscape has has changed for you yes thank you and i want to i i think we're i think we do need to have more conversations you and i but i do want to say one thing about um choosing life is when i was a child and i read moses the very old man moses who's about to die and he says to the israelites i've therefore choose life i've set before you life and death and when i read that it was like oh my god somebody gets it that i mean this is a crazy thing to say like people shouldn't have to choose life right we as biological beings we are we are hardwired to want to live we fight for life but moses knew something that i always felt like i didn't want to live i shouldn't live and somehow it seemed that moses got that that when when people have a choice between life and death it's not always easy for us to choose life and that in fact i think a lot of people would say you know even people who are not in the extreme kind of situation that i'm in i think there are a lot of people who are living partly alive right they've they're not feeling like they're able to be fully alive they are afraid of fully choosing life and i certainly was aware that there would be terrible and difficult consequences if i if i chose life and one of the um consequences that i didn't uh realize was that when i uh, started to transition and started to have a body that felt like my own and a life that felt like my own, I was flooded with feelings. It turns out human beings feel stuff all the time. And I had not felt things very much. I had a very, very um, black and white movie, emotional landscape. There were some extreme feelings of the sort that I've described. But most of the other stuff, because it's so rooted in the body and connection to it, dissociation it just blurted out so i what and it was they're not all good feelings i know nobody who's listening to this is surprised at this but i was shocked i thought you know you choose life you become yourself you live happily ever after in some kind of way and it turns out people feel all kinds of things and my therapist said that was a good thing and i and i said to her i complained to her i fetched her is like why should i feel like sadness and anger and you know this kind of terrible stuff and you know that's not what i wanted and she's like this is you know you don't get to pick and choose you know being a human being means you feel it all and you need to embrace it all and it's taken me a long time to learn the gift of all of those feelings including the ones that um are the hardest um i did lose my marriage and um and i i knew that i was going to and that was awful for everybody um it was um uh, it was a very bad breakup and so that was terrible for the children i don't think that my transition per se was that bad for the kids they were pretty young and we were living in a very liberal area um they went to schools that were far more gender progressive than anything I could even imagine. But there, it was difficult for them socially. And that was amplified. You know, whenever there is a bad divorce, kids feel caught in the middle and they feel like they have to choose sides. And so my children suffered terribly. And I didn't know how to be a parent with I thought my, my ex and I were, I thought we were great co-parents. I thought that was something that right to the end we did really well 
but it took me a long time to learn how to be the non-custodial parent on my own. And um, that didn't make things easier for my kids. So I do think it was better than my killing myself. You know, as there, one therapist told me uh, when I was in a, a bad state, she said, you have to stay alive so your children can reject you. And I said, this is, this is the pep talk. This Amen. is the way you're going. <laughs> and she said, yeah, absolutely. Because you're not just living for you. You know, they need to be able to go through, work through their anger with you and not get stuck in it. And what she really gave me in addition to that, that is absolutely true as a parent. But in addition, she was saying, my life matter, you know, and, and when I, when you're a trans person, I think this is true for LGBTQ plus people in, in general. Like when I was growing up as a Jewish male, there were all kinds of messages, explicit and implicit, that my life mattered. But nobody taught me that my life as a trans person mattered. Even today, there are no messages that your life as a trans person matters. We haven't gotten anywhere near that stuff. There are people who do better and worse. There are individuals we say, yeah, that's a great person. But if you're a kid growing up, nobody, no parent says, I hope my kid grows up transgender. And nobody says, now that you're transgender, here's, you know, the way, the way you might say, like my son, I wanted my son to think about what kind of man he was going to be. But nobody thinks about, well, what does it mean to be a good trans person? You know, what is the morale that, you know, what are the moral standards? What are you aspiring to? What's your function in the human species? So when she said that, I was angry, but I think something in me said, oh, wow even as a trans person my life actually matters other people need me to be in the world as myself i think it was the first time i'd really heard somebody say that other people were saying it won't be so bad even after you transition so um the teaching thing there was quite a bit of upheaval um i guess Fortunately, my gender transition more or less coincided with Bernie Madoff coming out as um, a con artist. And, you know, he was the treasurer of my university mm -hmm. and um, stole $100 million of our endowment. So the university had bigger problems than me. Right. I was a problem, but I really wasn't the biggest problem right, that they the had to deal with. <laughs> Well, let me, um, you know, I, I felt something liberating and I, I want to make myself vulnerable um, in this conversation. I want to read a paragraph um, on page 234 in your book where you speak about going to a uh, Jewish retreat uh, for um, queer Jewish women and how they didn't know what to make of you. And you, you write... I was also uncomfortable identifying myself as queer, apart from a shared legacy of social oppression, gay and trans people don't have much in common. Sexual orientation is unrelated to gender identity, and thanks to the gay rights movement, gay people have less and less oppression to share with us. In LGBT settings, the acronym referred to a list of distinct sexual preferences and gender identities my differentness was implicitly acknowledged. Queer was something else again, an umbrella term designed to make a single us out of a variety of thems. And I guess what, what, what struck me about that is um, I myself fumble with language, right? Uh, and, and even being in dialogue with you publicly like this, the very words I use, queer, trans, transgender, transsexual, um, LGBTQ+, um, all, uh, and, and what is signaled and signified by all of these terms. And we live in a moment in time where, you know, this, um, you know, that it was that game we played when we were little, the, the operation where 
you're you're you take something out and if you if you go too far this way or too far this way it buzzes and you've lost your turn and i feel um that um you know i am uh trying desperately to find the vocabulary to create a culture um that is forgiving as we all um take our steps gingerly into this new territory and and i'm wondering what you know are there are there resources are there are there ways to think about this because i feel like the um the maybe even the vocabulary that was used five years ago or ten years ago might be different today and um how do we find our bearings mm -hmm. in um in what please god will be a, a new world that is a great question, and I love the operation metaphor. I that where has that been all my life? I I think I have the right game. Do you remember it? When yes, we were, when we it, were was kids? it was operation. Yeah, operation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I I love the ads for it, but I've I've had that feeling so often, and what I would say is that in I think social media, particularly Twitter, where people have only a few words, so the and the importance of individual words and small utterances is magnified um, beyond the capacity of small utterances to convey meaning so that words get in the way of understanding. For me as a teacher and as a person, but as a teacher, I've always felt like my job is to try to understand others and to help others understand. And the as you're saying, the vocabulary, particularly around the plus, you know, gay and lesbian, those are venerable terms. Um, they still, there has been shifting meanings and there are other terms within uh, gay and lesbian communities that denote other, uh, you know, particular ways of being gay or lesbian, but they, those terms have had a long history and correspond you know, they're kind of socially established. Um, bisexual is a, a term that refers to people, but it's there's been far less attention to people who identify as bisexual. And when you get beyond that, things are really greatly in flux. There are a lot of words, and there isn't that much understanding. And the reason for that is partly that... Um, the vocabulary keeps changing and evolving. Uh, partly, it's an exciting, although somewhat maddening thing, which is once we've given ourselves, now that we've given ourselves permission to look inside ourselves and say, well, what is my relation to gender and identity? Like, how would I really describe it? You know, when I was growing up, I wasn't supposed to ask myself, what's my relation to gender and identity? I just couldn't avoid it. I didn't want to. But uh, children and younger people are growing up in a culture where it's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's, well, how do you identify yourself? What do you, you know, my, one of my children started asking, you know, how can I tell if I'm lesbian or queer or pansexual? And I said, well, you know, as you're 10 years old. Why don't you wait till you're sexual? And then you'll, you know, you'll be able to figure it out. So we're looking inside ourselves and we're realizing there's this wide variety of ways that we feel about these things. And I think that ultimately that's a great thing to become more aware mm -hmm. of the range, but we don't have um, settled vocabulary and social understandings have not caught up with that. But the other thing is that trans identities, so um, traditional gender identities and a lot of traditional identities. Uh, Jewish identity is a good parallel. I didn't feel that I was Jewish. Many people who convert to Judaism, Jews who convert to Judaism, they feel that they're Jewish and then they go through a conversion process. That's called a self-identification process. You literally can't convert unless you first identify yourself as Jewish. It's a paradoxical thing. Only people who are not Jewish can convert to Jew Judaism. I couldn't convert as a Jew, although I'd probably know more if I did. Um, but 
So you can only convert if you're not Jewish, but you only enter the conversion process if you identify yourself as a Jew. This is directly parallel to the situation for trans people. So you, nobody tells you that you are any of the trans queer plus identities. There's no external identification the way when I was born, my parents immediately saw me as a Jew. If they hadn't, I mean, it's hard for me to imagine not identifying as a Jew, but honestly, if I'd been born in a different family, I wouldn't have felt that I was Jewish. Now, somehow I feel that I was Jewish, but it really is an identity that I took into myself from the outside. My sense of gender identification, that was purely internal. It was in defiance of that. So you can't have trans and non-binary and these other identities except through a process of self-determination. Because by definition, those identities, they're not determined by who you're born to. They're not part of your family. Like, well, I was born into a working class family in such and such place. Mm -hmm. It's not that. They're not determined by people looking at you and saying, well, you really look non-binary. Let's raise this child as non-binary. No, that doesn't happen. We do that with male and female. We say, ah, this looks like a female child. We're going to raise this as a female child. We don't even think about it. That's an externally determined or a socially assigned identity assigned at birth. But trans identities are more like Jewish Jews who convert. It's a, it's a way that you have to know yourself. No, I, I never thought of it that way. And, I, and I've thought and I've written a lot about uh, conversion. Um, and um, you, we don't know each other, but I've sort of, uh, you know, have a definite view on it and a very uh, progressive view in some circles, not progressive enough in other circles. Um, but I'm, I, you, you, you've, it's a fascinating meditation on how identity works um, and doesn't work as um, and it goes back to the poem that Linda began with um, by you of um, of crossing boundaries and borders um, and how we do so and um, what what traits are sort of indigenous and what traits can be transformed and I mean I, you've given us all a lot to think about and I think that one of the things that uh, we're going to do at the end of this conversation is when we we send out the, the 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 tape as it were we have this whole mechanism to put this conversation online we'll also perhaps have some reading beyond just your book that we can put proper resources uh in front of people that um and i, I look forward to talking to you about it you know we you, you did um send me uh an essay on uh um biblical theology and beginning to sort of um, write what a, a, a trans commentary to the Bible would be. And it, it got me thinking about, because um, that's actually where, where my roots are, not surprisingly as a rabbi. And um, one of my uh, professors um, in, at, in Chicago was, uh, when I was getting my PhD, there was Tikva Frimer Kensky, um, who was one of the great feminist uh, wow. Bible scholars of blessed memory. And, you know, you think about verses, on the one hand, you have uh, a Hebrew Bible, um, which um, has very clear prohibitions against wearing, um, you know, clothes of a different gender and, and all sorts of uh, pr uh, prohibitions against um, mixing and very boundaried um, notion of identity. On the other hand, you know, from the very get-go, the, the very first verse about humanity is um, Zacharu Tam, that God created um, the first human being um, with, I mean, it's been translated a million ways, but it seems to be saying that there were aspects of, of, of male and female within that very first Adam, that um, Adam Harishon, and actually that first being um, who was set to sleep and anesthetized, and then the rib came out, and then gender distinct. I mean, so, you know, it, it, it gets to um, this question which, with which you began about um, the, you know, um, of, of biblical theology and, you know, being created in the image of a God who on the one hand um, bears aspects um, of both genders, on the other hand, um, seems to be 
um, you know, very clear in some some difficult passages in Leviticus um, about um, boundaries and boundaries that shouldn't be crossed. Um, so, what would the beginning of a um, transgender uh, commentary look like? Well, um, the essays I sent you came from that uh, the book, The Soul of the Stranger, Reading God and Torah from a Transgender Perspective. And I don't want to, really don't want to pretend to be the voice of transgender commentaries on Torah, but I can tell you where it starts for me. One thing is that there is no gender that I've seen in the Torah or really in um, ancient uh, rabbinic commentaries. The Torah is very practical. It's very much about bodies. Bodies have different sexes. You know, there are physically male bodies, there are physically female bodies, there are a variety of intersex bodies that can't be categorized as male or female as the rabbis recognized. Um, and But gender is not about our bodies, it's about how we interpret our bodies. It's about what we believe our bodies, what our relation to our bodies is, the degree to which they do and don't express us and how they express us and our social interpretations of our bodies. Clothes are a great example of gender. There's nothing about a physically male or female body that corresponds to any particular kind of clothing as Adam and Eve found out, right? They, you know, so... Right. So that's the difference between sex and gender. Gender is really, it's culture. It's the realm of interpretation or individual psychology. And the Torah really doesn't care how people feel very much. It's people's lives are far too brief for the most part for the Torah to spend a lot of time. Like in a, if you think about any halfway competent novel, there's much more description of how people feel than you'll find in, you know, the entire life of Sarah. How did Sarah feel on any given Tuesday? You know, how did she feel when uh, Yitzchak was born? You know, we, none of that stuff is in there. And that's the realm of where gender is. So but the Torah very practically says if you have male and female bodies, you can't put on the clothing the, what, that the culture has assigned to different kinds of bodies. The reasoning for that is mysterious. It is striking that there is no penalty for that. I mean, believe me, this verse was very important to me as a child. I was trying to figure out what to make of it because I felt like in my occasional furtive cross-dressing was my only chance to experience you know, some sort of being myself. Um, so I tried to talk my way all the way through it. But basically, uh, you know, it just says God will uh, abominate you or have terrible feelings towards somebody who does this. But there's no social penalty. You're not cut off. It doesn't say if you are a Kohen and you cross dress, you can't be a Kohen anymore. There are other offenses that have actual penalties here. It just says, you know, God is not going to be okay with this. And I have to say that as a trans kid who felt so lonely, the idea that God was paying that kind of attention to me, enough attention to be really upset by what clothes I wore, there was something sort of comforting about that. It was like God was really present in this intrusive sort of way. I also couldn't tell if I was cross-dressing because if I really felt that I was, I really identified as female, then wasn't I cross-dressing when I was presenting myself as a male? Like I just, my circuits, little circuits fried as a kid. So the thing that made it clearer for me was the, the part that you started out referring to. Um, the part that precedes God making people male and female, human beings male and female, and then syntactically indeterminate phrase. Mm -hmm. Three times before that, God says, we're making human beings in God's image. And of course, the Torah insists that God doesn't have an image. You shouldn't even imagine an image for God. So this is the, the original Jewish koan. What is the image of a God who doesn't have an image? And how do human beings reflect that image? So for me as a trans person, it was always clear that God had no gender because God doesn't have a body to interpret. 
as an adult, I would say that when we think of God as male or female, we're using the language of gender, which is our language of relationship. In most of our lives, we use gender as a medium for a relationship. We're using it to create a relationship to God. You know, when we think of God as male, that connotes certain human things and it fosters certain kinds of relationships. When we think of God as female, the same thing. But I knew that the God I was hanging out with as a kid was neither of those because God was completely beyond all of those things. So to me, the image of God is the aspect of us that can't fit in any human categories, that can't be comprehended. Because the part of us that it most reflects God, that's most looks like God, is the part of us that's incomprehensible in human terms. Because that's the one thing we know about God, is that God is incomprehensible in human terms. So in that sense, I would say that all of those, that nobody actually completely fits the categories that were assigned to and that were given. Many of us fit them more comfortably than I fit gender categories. I fit a lot of them more comfortably than I fit. You know, I've had fit very comfortably into the category of whiteness, for example. I really needed to try to make myself less comfortable with that category. But none of us perfectly fit that because we are all made in the image of a being that always overflows that. And when we're conscious of the ways that we don't fit, it's very uncomfortable for us most of the time. But I think that if we put those feelings that are so uncomfortable, if we live with them, if we value them, then we'll find that we're valuing the aspects of ourselves that are most reflect our kinship with the one who created us. So that's the basis for me of trans theology and Torah. Well, wow. All right, we really need to have a follow-up to this conversation. I have to say, Dr. Layden, the, as you're, we're going through the various verses um, of Genesis, um, uh, whether it's to be created in God's image, whether it's uh, uh, the gender and the um, uh, that, must, that must mean we're at times up. But the language, uh, the verse uh, that came to my mind is in uh, chapter two of um, Lotov Hayota Dam Lavado, that it's uh, mm. not good for a person to be alone. And I hope that um, by having this dialogue with you, um, that um, we have signaled um, to our community something important um, about um, our, our desire that no one um, should be alone. And, um, and I would ask, um, and I'll ask you one last question, a very brief one, um, which is a very biblical uh, way yeah. to bid farewell, which is I'm going to ask of you to give our community a blessing. And if you mm. could bless and charge us, right? You can also make us a little uncomfortable, but um, what would be your wish for our community mm. and communities like ours um, as we, under Linda's leadership and through Rabbi Kaufman and so many professionals at Park Avenue Synagogue, um, what would you bless us and charge us with as we set out the course ahead? Wow. Well, I am going to shamelessly crib from something that you said earlier, because I thought it was really great. I, may your congregation continually work to be a place where everyone can bring and is encouraged to bring their whole selves, all of the messy parts of themselves, the parts that are valued and the parts that are less valued, that it's a place of honesty and of wholeness and it's a place where when people are not bringing their whole selves, um, that is missed, right? And it's a place where when you look around and you have that comfortable feeling that, wow, I'm surrounded by folks like me, that you say, wait a second, I'm surrounded by folks like me. That means there are a lot of Jews who are not here because there are a lot of Jews who are different from me. And that you, may your congregation see that those two things are connected because the people that we see as different from us 
What we see in them as different is helping us recognize parts of ourselves that we don't know how to recognize. This was Walt Whitman's insight into American. He believed that every American had pieces of every other American, and that only by identifying with every single person in this country could we fully be ourselves. May your congregation be a place that realizes that vision. Thank you. May we all contain multitudes. Amen. Amen. Um, Dr. Layden, we're honored by your presence. We look forward uh, to the conversation continuing, and we thank all those members of our community who have made this conversation possible. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Laila Tov Thank you.